Good morning, and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Flint. If you are new to us, let me tell you a bit about us. One expression that we used to use in this congregation a lot, and it still comes up now and then, is deeds, not creeds. To me, it has meant and continues to mean that we as humans need to choose our individual paths by what we believe to be important, and then to live those paths in ways that speak our truths. This congregation has many social justice firsts in its history. Our services in the late 50s and early 60s drew the attention of the McCarthy hearings on communism. Our parking lot was under surveillance, and license plate numbers were taken by the FBI. During Flint's integration war, white Unitarians spent the night in black people's newly integrated homes because if there was trouble, and there was much trouble, a black voice would not bring either the police or the fire department. A white voice was required. We were the first to rent office space to gay and lesbian people. This was done at a time when rentals to those people, in quotes, were being destroyed and made unrentable. We have many more firsts, but this is a short welcome. If you would like to know more about Unitarian Universalism or our congregation, please feel free to contact one of our ministers or our office. The contact information can be found at uuflint.org. And now some announcements. Join us for coffee hour after the service on Zoom. The ID can be found on the website and in the e-update. Next week, during the service, we will be collecting for the UUA Social Justice Program established in the honor of our former minister, Waite Still Sharp. For Reverend Jerry, UUs, please take action and help make our state capital safe from gun violence. The United States Capitol and 32 states prohibit all firearms in their state capitals, but not Michigan. Democratic state representatives Julie Brixey and Tyrone Carter are working to change this and have introduced legislation calling for a full ban on firearms in the Capitol building and on its grounds. Please see this week's e-update for details on how you can call your state representative and voice your support for this common sense legislation. Your call can make a difference. From Raina Bick, we have a Gift of Life virtual trivia night. February is Organ Donor Month, and in celebration of Valentine's Day, we are having an educational and fundraising virtual trivia night with the Gift of Life of Michigan. This will be February 11th from 7 to 8.15 p.m. For further information, go to golm.org right slash trivia. It's a time for generosity. February is the month that honors black history, so I will use a quote from Maya Angelou. She, has tells, she tells us, I have found that among its other benefits, giving liberates the soul of the giver. Giving of your time, talent, and treasure is what can liberate your soul. Giving from your pocket helps keep our doors open. Consider giving online at uuflint.org or by sending a check to the church office. Thank you for the gifts you give. Money and work are all appreciated. Now we go to Jennifer for the prelude. Today's speaker 
is Sharon Peterson from the Michigan Unitarian Universalist Social Justice will be speaking today on welcoming congregation renewal and social justice. She will touch on how welcoming congregation renewal relates to MUUSJN's social justice work and why renewing welcome congregation renewal is important. She will also cover LGBTQIAN+. What do all those letters stand for? Sharon will use words relating to gender and sexual orientation, so you may want to screen this presentation before sharing it with your young children unless you've had the talk with them already. Finally, she will talk about how to be an ally. Sharon was born in Joliet, Illinois, one of 10 children, and grew up mostly in Brooklyn, Michigan. She lived in Ann Arbor for 14 years, getting her bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Michigan and working with a variety of nonprofit organizations. Sharon and her spouse, Mindy, moved to Jackson to purchase a home in 1994. Most recently, Sharon worked with MUUSJN's Interfaith Get Out the Vote campaign and has turned her attention to the LGBTQ advocacy at MUSSJN's request. Our first reading is from the Religious Institute and was written as a responsive reading originally for National Coming Out Day 2011. We are grateful for the gift of our lives and the gift of other people in our lives. Each of us is created with dignity and worth. We are called to love one another and to do nothing to others that we would find hateful to ourselves. We honor the many ways that people live and love. Our common life is enriched when lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender teens can live and learn without fear in their schools, homes, and communities. True justice flourishes when all people can live with authenticity and integrity. We repent of our silence in the face of cruelty in our schools and communities. Our silence leads to death. We weep at the senseless loss of life. Recognizing the richness of diversity, the beauty and wonder of shared worship, and the transforming power of love and service, we gather as a sacred, intentional community to freely seek knowledge and truth, to celebrate the fullness of life, and by our actions to increase goodness and justice. The opening words are by Mark Bellatini. The Reverend Mark Bellatini is a minister emeritus from the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Columbus, Ohio. He served as a chair of the Hymn Book Resources Commission, which produced the 1993 UUA hymnal, Singing the Living Tradition. He is the author of the 2008 UUA Meditation Manual, Sonata for Voice and Silence, Meditation and the Pamphlet, Worship in UU Congregations, and Nothing Gold Can Stay, The Colors of Grief, Skinner House 2015. How to Discuss the Truth How to discuss, how to discuss the truth that some men love men, and some women, women, and some both, with the children in church school at home, nonchalantly, without drum rolls, without tiptoe preparations, without calculating and predicting to the nth degree, with candor, with open ears, with unfailing tenderness, with one foot in the realm of God and the other foot in the solid earth, made of ashes of Radcliffe Hall, Auden, Da Vinci, Emma Goldman, Susan B. Anthony, and Mark DeWolf, with real hope in purpose and thanksgiving in our pulse, with the full iris of our living tradition in the eye, without using the inherited Augustinian scalpel that splits flesh from spirit and pleasure from good, without homilies on toleration, with the words, some of us, and not the words, them and they, with as much heart as intellect, without embarrassment, with stories and examples as wonderful as a tale by Seuss, with rhapsodies on the glories of friendship, with gladness for uncertainties, and with joy. And now Jennifer will play one of the songs 
uh, let freedom span both east and west. It's number 148 in the hymnal. reading from the Gray Hymnal, number 597, Love Versus Hate, by Dharmapada. Never does hatred cease by hating in return. Only through love can hatred come to an end. Victory breeds hatred. The conquered dwell in sorrow and resentment. They who give up all thought of victory or defeat may be calm and live happily at peace. Let us overcome violence by gentleness. Let us overcome evil by good. Let us overcome the miserly by liberality. Let us overcome the liar by truth. Now we're going to do the song, We Are a Gentle Angry People, number 170.
As Pam mentioned, I'm Sharon Peterson from the UU Social Justice Network, or MOOSGEN, your statewide UU Social Action Network. I'm glad to be a part of your service. We'll touch on these things today. How does the welcoming congregation renewal relate to MUSGEN's social justice work? And then LGBTQIAN+, what do all those letters stand for? I will use LGBT for short. And as was mentioned, parents, I'll use words relating to gender and sexual orientation so you may want to screen this presentation before sharing it with your children, unless you've had the talk with them already. What is welcoming, what is welcoming renewal and why is it needed? And how to be an ally. I attend the Universalist Unitarian Church of East Liberty near Jackson, Michigan, and I became involved with Moosejun when I obtained a part-time job working on the nonpartisan Get Out the Vote campaign last May. So Moosejun was an organization or is an organization started by Michigan UU congregations to organize the congregations around social justice issues. And how does welcoming congregation renewal relate to Moosejun's other social justice work? Well, each year Moosejun's board chooses a handful of social justice issues to work on and the current issues for 2020 and 2021 are get out the vote, which is kind of wrapping up as you know, <laughs> women's LGBT plus and reproductive justice, racism and immigration reform, economic justice, gun violence prevention, and one I know is near and dear to you, water and environmental justice. So, several of you were involved with phone and text banking with me on Get Out the Vote. Thank you. And Reverend Jerry Kerr is on Moosejun's Board of Directors. The type of work Moosejun does includes legislative advocacy, action alerts to congregations to encourage contact with legislators and related advocacy, educational Zooms, and cross-sector organizing, such as working with the organization Mothering Justice on Earn Paid Leave, and with Restaurant Opportunity Center Michigan on One Fair Wage. Moose Gin relies on membership contributions from both individuals and congregations, and we appreciate your support. You can go to uujustice.org to join or make a donation. People are very busy, so we're lucky to have Moose Gin do some of the social justice heavy lifting and research for and on behalf of Michigan UU congregations. I feel privileged to have been hired after my get out the vote work to do welcoming and LGBTQ plus advocacy. That means I get to encourage congregations like yours to do welcoming renewal and to let congregations know about advocacy opportunities for LGBTQIAN plus rights. We're moving in the right direction with President Biden undoing some of the previous administration's executive orders that limited LGBT rights, such as the ban of transgender folks in the military. We still have work to do to enshrine these rights in our state and federal laws, not just the executive orders. So I'll be letting you know when there are advocacy opportunities to support amendment of the Elliot Larson Civil Rights Act at the state level, for instance. That's coming up soon, we hope. So LGBTQIAN+, what do all these letters stand for? You're probably familiar with the acronym LGBT, so I'll mostly talk about QIAN+. The I usually stands for intersex, persons who are born with unclear genitalia or have gender differences that manifest maybe at puberty and therefore may have gonads and or traits of both male and female. Traditionally, that trait has been quote unquote corrected at birth, but there's a movement to not do surgeries on children who present as intersex, instead waiting until the child is old enough to make their own decision about whether they want those surgeries. Now, a frontier that's coming to be more understood is non-binary people. Those who cannot define themselves or refuse to have others define them as one gender or another 
instead believing that gender is a more fluid concept for themselves. So hence non-binary, not zero or one, like computer language. They might use they, their, or even per as their pronoun instead of he, him, his, or she, her, hers, and use terms like queer or genderqueer that may be at first off-putting to people who thought of the Q word as derogatory. But it's like the word dyke or the F word for guys. Straight people shouldn't use these words for someone unless they've been told they prefer them because they may be thought of as epithets. But the LGBTQ plus community may use them internally to embrace their identity. In fact, I learned a new acronym from the UU World Magazine last year and it's mentioned in the welcoming congregation renewal process, TGQNB. I know, more letters, but that stands for transgender, queer, non-binary, or some people say it trans, gender, queer, non-binary. <laughs> and it can encompass anyone who feels they don't fit into stereotypical male, female, heterosexual roles. Some people though use Q for questioning those who at this time in their lives are questioning what gender or sexual orientation they will consider themselves. A can be for not a, sorry, A can be for asexual, not having a sexual attraction or desire for other people, or can also refer to allies who are supportive of the LGBT plus community, usually heterosexual or what they call cisgender, those whose gender identity corresponds with their birth sex are called cisgender. Activists have added the plus sign to LGBTQIAN plus to refer to people who self-identity, who self-identify as a sexuality or gender minority, but might not feel they are defined by other initials. I found it interesting too, to see that some people use the plus to indicate folks who are HIV positive. While this isn't a sexual minority, the discrimination felt by those who are HIV positive is very similar and often goes along with being a sexual minority. So what is welcoming congregation renewal and why is it needed? So many churches are welcoming, why do they need renewal? Well, as you might know, the welcoming congregation movement started over 25 years ago. And then there are five practices of welcome renewal that are benchmarks that every congregation should integrate into their life to ensure that lesbian, <clears throat> excuse me, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, asexual, two-spirit, genderqueer, non-binary, and the like feel fully welcomed and embraced in our UU congregations. Welcoming congregations should meet the following benchmarks annually in order to remain current as a welcoming congregation. Your congregation's annual welcoming pra practices get submitted to the UUA using an easy checklist you can find on the internet. And renewing congregations then receive a certificate and appear on the UUA website under renewed. You already appear as welcoming, but this is kind of like an added credential if you want to call it that. So it's a pretty simple practice. And here's the five practices. The first is to become a welcoming congregation. So you can put check mark for Flint. I'll just skip past that. Then you have welcoming worship services. The second practice is incorporating worship services at least two per year into your ordinary calendar of worship every year that deal with welcoming. The services might, might occur during LGBT plus pride month or any other day of observance. An LGBT marriage ceremony in the service, a naming ritual for a trans person perhaps, or remembrance ceremonies may also fulfill this objective. And good news, my talk today counts for one of yours. Three is welcoming days of observance. This third practice is annual recognition and celebration of at least six of the welcoming days of observance outlined by the UUA. And they have a list that's maybe 14 or more that can feature just a candle lighting, a prayer, a story, chalice lighting, extinguishing, song, art form, et cetera, that honors the occasion. In other words, it's a mention during the service and often can get incorporated during either announcements or candle lighting. 
These days and seasons are important to LGBT plus folks and the communities because they bring visibility and affirmation after generations of invisibility and erasure. And in fact, several of them are called like um, Invisibility Day or Visibility Day in fact, or Day of Silence, commemorating silence. So it's very important. These days remind all that all of who you are is sacred. All of who you are is welcome. If you do a pride service, for instance, that can count toward both this and the two services requirement. If this, basically the whole service focuses on pride. Number four is um, congregational religious education. Usually it's adult RE. The fourth practice is an annual opportunity for the congregation to experience a religious education manual, module on welcoming congregation. A welcoming congregation module is a UUA approved seminar or webinar. It can be a one-time or multi-meeting class, such as the one my congregation, congregation is doing this year, Transgender Inclusion and Congregations, which I understand also deals with other types of inclusion. Each year, the UUA LGBTQ program office will offer at least one new welcoming webinar engaging these issues and topics. Um, so welcoming congregations can register for a webinar or may choose to sponsor a local seminar for its congregation and community. You can host a movie talk back, a book discussion group. You're asked to do a brief UUA evaluation form with folks who take it and submit that with a little checklist of the five practices to the UUA to let them know you did what you did for each of these steps and also how it went basically. So if you have a local idea for this, you just run this by Reverend Michael Crumpler, who I think I'll mention later. He's a great guy to work with at the UUA and he'll approve your religious education plan, whether it's one time or multi. Finally, support a welcoming project. And that's the fifth and final practice to remain current Welcoming congregations may make a meaningful donation to a local or national organization, campaign, or project that uplifts the dignity of LGBTQ communities. You can fulfill that by raising funds for PFLAG, for example, or many other worthy organizations. And I've heard that you already support a local group by providing free or reduced cost meeting space, and you participate in a local pride celebration. So these two actions would likely already fulfill this step long as you're doing it. As I mentioned, Reverend Michael Crumpler of the UUA supervises the welcoming congregation renewal process. He holds monthly orientations, which some of your church members have already attended, and he's a wonderful resource. The UUA expects churches to renew annually because they recognize the need to be welcoming on an ongoing basis. So you just incorporate that into your regular church year and it becomes pretty easy. Finally, I wanted to touch on how to be an ally. We should always be welcoming to visitors in our churches. We had a person who visited my coffee hour at church a few times. She looked like she was going to an aliens convention. This was before COVID and she had her face so covered up, including with sunglasses, that she looked like an astronaut or an alien. I had heard she had environmental allergies and that made sense. I was welcoming of her at my church but I have to say I didn't do as good a job when someone wearing lipstick and feminine attire attended a lesbian dinner in my community that I was at. I challenged her, emailing her and saying, like, what are you? Very uncool in this current modern age of gender fluidity. Not very welcome. The funny thing is, believe it or not, that was the same person I'd accepted at coffee hour. So <laughs> there is room for people who are different from us including those on the autism spectrum, gender non-conforming folks, for instance. What if instead we embrace difference when we see it at our churches and congregations? How can be, <clears throat> excuse me, how can one be a great ally for the LGBTQ community? Here's some pointers. Don't assume someone is straight or gay or et cetera. Oftentimes it's okay for that to be unknown ask yourself, why do I need to know their sexual orientation or gender identity? If it's important for some reason that you know, 
You could start a conversation pri privately, like what are your pronouns? And by the way, many, many gender conforming people are using their pronouns after their name to show that it's no big deal and to indicate openness to non-conforming folks. So now I sign my emails, Sharon Peterson, parentheses, she, her, hers. Ask your LGBT plus friends if they're comfortable being out. Don't assume they are. Don't out them to others because it could still cause trouble with their work, family, home, etc. I cringed at my church when, after people attached rainbow flags to their name tags to show openness, a grandfather who had joined the church later explained to his grandson that it indicated that person was gay. <laughs> That could have caused problems for that guidance counselor at the school where he worked because we still don't have our um, equal protection enshrined in law. Don't assume gay people are interested in kids or having kids, but don't assume they aren't. Don't assume that all LGBT folks want to get married or even have a partner. See if you can be supportive of gay youth. Is there a GSA chapter at your local high school nearby? Can you encourage one to form? Can you let U of M Flint's LGBTQ office know that your church is welcoming and offers spiritual solace? You might have already. I've recommended your church to them. Work toward passing state and federal laws to protect the rights of all LGBTQ plus people. Currently, the state's Elliot Larson Civil Rights Act doesn't explicitly protect lesbian, gay, and bisexual persons from the workplace, housing, or public accommodation discrimination. The state has interpreted it to protect transgender people, but again, let's put that in writing. Fair and Equal Michigan will be working on this further, and we'll want to advocate for this at the federal level also. So I'll try to keep you informed through your context on welcoming what's going on with these two uh, initiatives, both the, both the state and federal level. And renew your welcoming congregation status and show that you are, uh, show that you're renewed on your Facebook and website pages. Have a welcoming educational event or service during Pride Month maybe, perhaps co-sponsoring it with a local L LGBT organization to encourage people in your area to explore your congregation and realize it's a safe place to be themselves. In conclusion, I've seen that our nation's and state's laws can sway in the breeze and even lose ground, depending on whatever president, governor, or attorney general is in power at the time. It's important for heterosexual people to stick up for gay rights too, just like it's important for white people to adopt anti-racist stances. So I'm asking you to side with love, proclaim your intention to continue your welcoming congregation work on an ongoing basis, and don't let politicians and conservative religious groups be a voice that drowns out the voice of truth, justice, and reason. Thank you. And now I have a reading called Blessed Are the Trailblazers, by the Reverend Mr. Barb Grieve, who served as co-moderator of the Unitarian Universalist Association alongside Alondria Williams from 2017 to 2020. Blessed are the trailblazers who brought us this far and are still trailblazing and still celebrating. Blessed are the drag queens and kings who remind us to not take life too seriously. Blessed are the gender benders, non-binary, gender fluid, and third gender folk, those who challenge us to reframe our gender paradigm. Blessed are the young ones who present fearlessly from the start. Blessed are their parents who make space for freedom and love their children fiercely. Blessed are the siblings and relatives who educate, support, and love us as we are. Blessed are the genderqueer youth, those who are fabulously flourishing and those who are struggling and persist. Blessed are the 90-year-olds just coming out 
and those who have been out decades. Blessed are those whose lives were cut too short. May their stories live on through us. Blessed are the survivors. May their stories live on through us. Sorry, may they keep on living. Blessed are the ally, allies learning to be accomplices. Blessed are those gathered here today, witnessing, learning, celebrating. May we all continue showing up, fighting for justice, celebrating all the genders in life. Amen. We'd like you to join us in our second hymn for the day, 121 in our gray hymnal, We'll Build the Land. is from the Religious Institute and was written as a responsive reading for National Coming Out Day in 2011. And it starts, We are grateful for the gift of our lives and the gift of other people in our lives. 
each of us is created with dignity and worth. We are called to love one another and to do nothing to others that we would find hateful to ourselves. We honor the many ways that people live and love. Our common life is enriched when lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender teens can live and learn without fear in their schools, homes, and communities. True justice flourishes when all people can live with authenticity and integrity. We repent of our silence in the face of cruelty in our schools and communities. Our silence leads to death. We weep at this senseless loss of life. We suffer when LGBT persons are oppressed, excluded, and shamed by religious people who overlook the fundamental call to justice in our scriptures. Love does not exclude. We are all worthy. May we work to build a world where all people, no matter their perceived differences, are celebrated and loved. We celebrate sexual and gender diversity as a blessing that enriches us all. And now we'll extinguish the chalice. Recognizing the richness of diversity, the beauty and wonder of shared worship, and the transforming power of love and service, we gather as a sacred intentional community to freely seek knowledge and truth, to celebrate the fullness of life, and by our actions to increase goodness and justice. <laughs>